Welcome back to Your 1230, the only podcast where our guests tell their story with the help of 12 questions in just 30 minutes. I'm Mike Salute, your host, and today we are very excited to be speaking with Tony Acosta. Tony has been in the real estate industry since 2013. He started as a showing agent and made his way to principal broker. During that time, he's helped hundreds of families achieve their home ownership goals and helped grow his team to one of the most productive in the state of Utah. He made his mark on the market by answering questions on social media on his show, the hashtag Ask Tony Show. In 2020, he was inducted into the Forbes Real Estate Council and became director of the Utah Podcast Coalition. His passions outside of real estate include reading, podcasting, and watching sports. Tony, welcome. We are thrilled to talk to you today. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Can't wait. Got it. And there's a lot of things I want to ask you about, but what jumped out at me first was uh, that you made your mark by answering questions on the Ask Tony show. When I ask you that, which question comes to mind that I think either it got asked the most or this was the craziest question I got asked? So I think the, the most common question has just always been basic, right? What do I need to buy a house or how's the market doing? And so when I first got started, I didn't have a lot of connections. I was just 22 years old. I didn't have, you know, contacts or a network or anything like that. So really the only thing that I thought to do was, hey, I have this Facebook page. Instagram wasn't that cool back then. And I was getting asked questions because I was a showing agent. So I said, hey, you know, maybe if if one person has this question of, hey, how's the market doing? Then maybe a lot of other people will have the same question too. Uh, I mean, it's simple as you say it, but it's brilliant because if one person has it and has asked you, there's going to be a ton out there that want to know the answer. What um what did that look like to start? Were you getting were you kind of using the questions you were getting from your showings? Were you getting people to ask you live, or how has that evolved over time? So it was kind of twofold. Number one, I did start to be a lot more intentional of when I was doing showings of all of the questions that I was being asked. I had you know just on my phone, I would just write it down. And so I, when the showing ended, if they asked me for questions, I just got into the habit of writing them down. Um, and then also it was just trying to go back and remember previous questions that I had been asked before. Uh, but yeah, I, I did start to be a lot more kind of aware when I was out doing showings of the questions that people were asking. And then there was no production value. There was nothing. It was literally just my cell phone, just turn it on, record and say, Hey, I'm out here showing homes. They asked me about roofing and here's my take. And so I just kind of started that way. I wasn't running ads at the time, but it was a good way to kind of practice and kind of start to get a little bit comfortable in front of the camera. I love it. I love it. Um, and you know, during that transition, you went from a showing agent to now a, a broker of of your own agency. How how have you made that move? And what has your day to day? How has that changed over that time? Because I know that there's different different things you're doing now versus then. And and how has that uh, progression looked? Yeah, it's tremendously different. You know, when I first started as a showing agent, my only concern was finding properties for my broker's clients. And so I kind of got into the groove. I would go in every day, do my searches, send my listings, um, you know, coordinate the showings, go out. Uh, once I became a broker, it really was more of taking care of other agents and training other agents, making sure that they were taken care of, more work of systems and how can we optimize and where are our leads coming from. So it really became a lot more back-end work, which um, I enjoy, but I, I I do miss at some points being just face to face with families and with people and driving around and grabbing lunch. Um, but that I think was really the biggest transition going from just being face to face with clients every day to focusing on more of the back end stuff and the training. Sure. That makes sense when you're building out the business to have those systems in place, not to be as front and center face to face as you were when you were uh, the business one, one with the clients. Uh, as you have worked with hundreds of families, and you mentioned that was something that you uh, look fondly on, is there a go-to story that you have when you talk about representing a buyer or listing a home that it's like, this is this is why I do what I do, and this is why my clients hired me and continue to do so? Yeah. So I the first brokerage where I worked, it was pretty much 99% in the Latino community. So my family is from Mexico. I was born here in Utah, uh, but I have that you know Hispanic heritage. And so one of the things that I really fell in love with that I think is a little bit unique with, with our community is since for a lot of folks, there is a, a language barrier and real estate is different in other countries than it is here. It's different in Mexico or in Colombia or Bolivia or Peru. Uh, it's, it's The system is very, very different. So a lot of folks come in and they, they just have no idea. Like, 
They don't know what the protocols are, how to apply. Like it's basically ground zero. And, you know, in many cases, you, you see a lot of folks who, even though they, they make good money, they, they just don't know how to do it. And so I really fell in love with the education aspect, you know, of helping someone go from not knowing anything about real estate at all to now over time have two, three, four investment properties. So just kind of seeing that evolution of people and the growth within my own community that, that often has a, a very wide educational gap. I think has been very rewarding. And I think without saying it, you've kind of laid out the, I don't say the best blueprint, but a really outstanding one for someone who's either looking to break into the market as an agent or somebody who's trying or tried things and hasn't worked out. One, know what is valuable to your clients. What questions are they asking? How can I asking? How can I answer them and provide valuable information? And two, well, you know, not necessarily niching down. Well, who is my community? What can I bring to them? And what what might be a a point that brings us together, or something that we can bond around? So, it clearly, makes sense of how you've done that so well and have built a an outstanding business from that. Um, what can you tell us about one percent lists? The one percent list. It's actually interesting because out here in Utah, there is uh, a pretty well known company named Homie, and Homie came on the scene probably. Four, three or four years ago, and they're a discount brokerage. Um, and Utah responded very, very well to that. They, I mean, they ended up having, I think at one point, five to six percent or seven percent market share just by themselves, a small brokerage, wow. which in the state, you know, it that is tremendous in a very yeah. short time. And so one of the things that that I kind of latched onto that was this idea that because of certain technological tools transacting real estate can be simpler if we have the right tools. So this idea of 3% commission is great, but it was established pre-internet back when everything had to be done by hand. Like if you needed to sign a contract or something, you had to go to the person's house and they had these, and I'm sure you know, but the, like the, the contracts would have like the orange copy and the blue copy and the pink copy. And so you'd have to go sign it and then distribute all of those. Everything was done by hand. I, I can't imagine how people did a bunch of showings without the internet, having their maps and stuff. And so <laughs> now I, I genuinely believe that, you know, in this day and age, if we can leverage technology, uh, it can make things simpler and we can save people money. And all of the, the business uh, advancements or the tech advancements in the industry have primarily gone to the brokerages. They've primarily gone to help the agents be more effective, help the brokers, but I feel like the cost savings has not yet reached the consumer. It's always been for the agents and for the brokerages. And so I think that at some point, the benefit of tech has to reach the end consumer um, and try to save them some money in the same way it, it saved us money doing Zoom or whatever. I just feel that at, at some point, those savings have to reach the end consumer. And with 1% lists, uh, having just a more efficient, streamlined process uh, it's worked very well because we can save people money and still give a really good service. No, you've hit on that. The 3% is the industry standard and that's been established for a long time. And if you ask plenty of brokers, agents, why that is, it's, well, that's it's the way that it's always been, which is generally a terrible answer for any time uh, that that's given. Uh, so I like the way that you've kind of laid out that there are cost savings, that things are obviously more streamlined. We don't have the triplicate and you know duplicate forms that were running around all day uh, and how it's benefited the brokerages. And we're passing that on to not only a better client experience by streamlining it, by also passing along the the savings. Uh, have you received, I'm sure you have, <laughs> what, what feedback have you got from other brokerages in the community uh, that you uh, work alongside with um, such a forward thinking business model that might uh, impact what they are, they are doing and what they're ultimately charging their clients? Yeah, for sure. So there's always mixed emotions, right? Some people are not a fan, which makes perfect sense. Uh, but surprisingly, I've had a lot of conversations with people who, when we when we talk about the model, they're like, that makes sense, but I can't do it. And I can't do it either because I have a broker that won't allow it. Or some brokers are like, man, I have like my overhead. If I did something like that, it would put me out of business because they have the big fancy office and they have the three receptionists and the assistants. And so their operation gets very expensive. And so, and that was actually something surprising because they're like, I mean, I get it. That makes sense. But 
I would have to fire a bunch of people to do that. And so it's this idea of trying to work off of volume, which I think you can do if you have the right systems in place. But I'm empathetic to that. You know, if, if you have an office that's $11,000 a month, I get it. Like there's not much wiggle room there. And then you have to pay all these salaries to people. So there are some, some mixed emotions. I, I don't get as much hate as I thought that I would when I jumped into this. Uh, outside of just like a couple of Facebook or you know, real estate groups. But it, it really is a situation where I think a lot of people realize that that's kind of where it's going, but the way they've set up their business at this moment in time just doesn't allow them to, to take those price cuts. And, you know, any other industry, that is how business operates, is how can we get our product better, faster, and less expensive to the client? in an experience that they want and something that they're willing to pay for. So it, it only makes sense. And you're absolutely right that it is, it started and is going to be on its way. Um, one thing I want to kind of follow up on that I thought was interesting. You mentioned the higher cost, the expensive office, the multiple administrative staff. Are you replacing all of that with technology or how are you able to run your business when others would like to, but can't? Yeah. So funny story. I was with uh, a brokerage for nine years where I, where I became the broker then I parted ways with that brokerage and I went to EXP for a short period of time. At EXP, I kind of learned the cloud model. Uh, and you know, they don't have a physical office like here in Utah. I know who the broker is, but she works from her house. So um, we do have an office. We do have you know, offices, but it's not the primary focus. So yeah, if I need to meet with someone in person, I can either meet, I'm at Security National right now, I can be here. I do have my own personal office that people can come to, but it's not overly expensive. So when you try to cut your own costs and keep it efficient, then you can allow yourself to charge a little bit more. And like you said, that's the way business, every other business runs. You try to cut costs to increase your profitability. The problem is that for a lot of agencies, they have big buildings and big offices. So I'll give you a quick example. My my whole office budget per month is about twelve hundred dollars, and that that includes you know, three three to four offices, a little studio space where we can record podcasts. So it's very very cheap compared to I mean I'm sure an office like this maybe costs fifteen sixteen thousand dollars a month, and it works because there are people that want to meet in person. We can absolutely, but pro honestly, probably seventy percent seventy five percent of the people that I meet with is all online. Yeah, and that's and that's the that's the point that I don't want to get lost here. That it's not cutting costs for the sake of cutting costs. It's still delivering to your clients what they want, where they want it, how they want it, but in a different manner that it's done. Because just following the we have the office because it's here and we use it. But if I'm meeting seventy to eighty percent online, I don't necessarily need to have this one hundred percent of the time. So do I have access to it? Yes. How can I leverage my relationships? How can I collaborate? So that makes a ton of sense. Um, the other thing I wanted to just follow up quickly on there. Uh, was you had, and I just I quickly lost it. Uh, I was going to just say that with uh, with with this different model as well, we talked about how other brokerages, how do clients receive it? Because I would think that they would be familiar with it to some level, but it might be kind of the first time they're hearing it when you meet with them. Yeah, so they love it. You know, when I sit down and, and I actually explain the way it works and how we can leverage these tech tools to get like, the same result, if not better, um, there's a very, very good response. And that was one of the reasons why I jumped into it in the first place, because Utah just fell in love with Homie. And Homie has its own set of issues. They have agents on salary and stuff. So they have some profitability issues. But the model itself, the discount model here in Utah was a tremendous hit. And so every now and then I will, you know, meet someone who's like, well, you know, you get what you pay for. And if it's like, it's, if it's too cheap, what I found is that in many cases, those people have agents in their inner circle that don't like the model. But I mean, we all like to save money, right? And I think it's one of those things where I'm in multiple uh, Facebook realtor groups and realtors are always asking questions like, hey, what's the cheapest brokerage? Who has this, the, the lowest split? Who has like, who's capped really, really low? So we, we are always looking to save money. We're always trying to keep as much of our commissions as we can. And a lot of agents jump from brokerage to brokerage with that intent, the sole intent of trying to keep more of their commission dollars. I just think there's nothing wrong with the seller trying to do the same thing with their equity dollars. Nice. And I don't want to get too much in the weeds. I just one last follow up. So with the 1% list, there's no uh, kind of built in 
split for the buyer's agent. Is that correct? So no, we we still pay the the buyer's agent their full commission. So okay. we don't we don't cheat the buyer. Uh, so a we will pay anywhere from two and a half to three percent. Because uh, I I was a showing agent, so I I get wow. it. One everywhere, but you know if someone can go from paying six percent to three and a half or four percent, that's a that's a substantial savings. When here in Utah, the average home is six hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so I wasn't aware of that, and by hearing that. It, just for anybody who's not familiar with the you know, the way that commission splits are, that is certainly putting your money where your mouth is, where you're saying that I can run my side of the business with a 1% split, but I acknowledge how difficult your job is on the uh, buyer representation side, and I'm still going to pay you what, quote unquote, is a full commission per industry standards. Uh, that is subject to change with many factors, but for the time being, uh, that's that's incredible. I, didn't, I did not... I did not calculate that in. Okay, so that's uh, that certainly shows that this model works and that you can run a business that a draws uh, people want to sell their home with you and that you can do so at at the one percent level. Well done, Tony. <laughs> you don't need to hear from me, but I'm impressed. Thank you. Um, kind of moving forward, the Forbes Real Estate Council. How did that come about? So that came about because there was there were only two agents uh, back in. 2019 that were on the council and I knew I knew one of them and so um, I saw what what he was doing he had he had a couple of articles published he would share those and I just thought it was it was cool so I at the time was not in a position to be able to apply for something like that because there are like production numbers that you have to hit there's like a selection process but I did my homework and I set it as a goal to try to to, to meet the numbers that were required in order to be able to be accepted. You do the application process. You have to like write essays and stuff. But it it was it was tremendous. You know, I was there from 2019 to 2021 when COVID hit. Uh, Forbes kind of you know did not continue the real estate council program, but it was tremendous. You know, I got to learn from so many great people. I got to you know network and and really just be a fly on the wall and learn from you know a broker in New York or someone that's in San Diego or just all these great people you know, agent teams in Dallas that were just killing it. And I really just, the, the, the biggest benefit for me was just being in those meetings and just listening to what they said. I mean, the growth that I experienced from not talking and just sitting in a room where everybody, pretty much everybody was better than me was substantial. And I mean, I can just tell based on that answer that you value the the idea to have access to information that either may not be market specific, tenure specific, or just to be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, we're on this console together. What do you think of this? So that you value other people's quote unquote you know, expert opinions. And even if it comes to the point, because sometimes you'll be in a networking situation where it's like, well, this is not going to bring me immediate business. So why am I doing this? But there is real value to having relationships both outside of your current transaction, a future transaction and outside of your market, because who knows uh, where those can lead. And as you state that having that forum can provide you insights that you certainly would not have uh, because they're just looking at things differently because they're, again, they're different markets, different, different tenures. So that's, that's really a great experience. Yeah, of course, because also, you, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And so often we're trying to figure it out or we're trying to reinvent the wheel in some way. And it may be completely unnecessary. And I've seen this happen time and time again, where we spend so many resources and trying to come up with a new way when really someone else can be just have a little bit of a different spin on things and it can work for you. But that's been the the, the biggest thing for me. It's just I didn't know what I didn't know. And when I left those meetings, I was like, ah, that makes sense. Okay, I like that. I'm going to do that. Where if I would have had to try to come up with that idea on my own, I probably would have never got there. And that that goes hand in hand with the kind of pushing the brokerage to a different model is having the mindset of what do, what don't I know? How can I find out? And how can I provide it to who I'm working with at a, at a better at a better rate, a better way? Uh, so that's, again, another another fantastic answer there. The last thing I kind of want to hit on the in part of the bio, the podcast coalition. How did that start and what does that look like? So when podcasting started at, well, it probably wasn't even that cool yet. It was probably back in 2017. As soon as I became principal broker, uh, I kind of felt like now I, I, I kind of knew enough and I was in a position where I could now start talking about real estate. I could start talking about coaching teams. I, I could start kind of 
talking about different topics outside of just the market. And so knowing that, uh, when we started talking about systems and I got really involved in marketing and all these different things, I started my podcast. And uh, the Podcast Coalition has been really fun. Basically, what, what it is, it's just a networking group. Of, we're trying to gather all the podcasters in Utah to just try to network and help each other other and build our shows but podcasting has been probably the most surprising lead generation tool that i've ever seen and the reason why i say that is because what most uh, a lot of people will do is they'll have a podcast and there are two ways to do it you can interview other industry professionals which is tremendous because it's what we just talked about that's one of the ways that you can learn but there's also just going out and trying to interview community leaders so i bring business leaders on the show. I bring up you know, people that are running for office, just really anybody influential in my community. I try to have a conversation with them. And what I found was when you spotlight somebody else, something very interesting happens for probably 70% of my audience. When they come on the show, it's the first time that somebody has paid attention to them in that way. And so what happens? They share it and their family members share it and their friends share it. And they're so excited because they were on this show. I mean, I've had people that organize watch parties for the release of the podcast, and it's just on YouTube. Like, it's not even on TV. But it's because they're so happy and proud of their story and of their accomplishments that when you give them that spotlight, their their eyes light up. And it's the best gateway drug for them, for then for somebody to say, okay, what show is this? And who is this person? And who's Tony? And Oh, we go to his Instagram. Oh, by the way, he's an agent and he does this content. And so it's been the best way to get people to know about me that otherwise would not have done so. Yeah, it's it can be difficult to properly shine that spotlight because as both of us are in the real estate industry, we know that sometimes that might be the 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 way that it's set out to and that it's not always properly shown on, on the right party and there might be some back backward but if you do it right you that's the best way to have a raving audience raving fans from that guest to their entire network because it's look this person sat with me asked me questions wanted to know what was important to me put put the answers out there and then has has a gave me a platform that otherwise they wouldn't have access to as well as to their audience so uh you're certainly right there that's that's the focus of this show as well that um and, and when we kind of first connected that was i want to get better in all different ways possible so how can i do that talk to people who have done it talk to people who are, are continuing to push the envelope forward so that makes a ton of sense um with with the um with a group or a coalition of all podcasters you must have uh some interesting backgrounds interesting stories what are those meet i'm assuming those meetings are, are virtual but what, what are they how many people are there what does it look like well, our meetings, we get about 50 to 60 people on a monthly basis. We meet in person once a month. Oh. And then we have a Facebook group uh, that we're you know, sharing information on. We bring on different speakers. For example, we, we've we had um, a news anchor here. Her name is Emily Flores. She came and she talked about going live and how to you know properly prepare if you're going to go live. She's on live every single day. And so how do you calm your nerves and how do you organize your thoughts? Because you can't do it, there are no do-overs. And so we try to bring in people like that that have experience in media. Not all of them are podcasters. We do also bring podcasters in. But yeah, I mean, we have podcasts of all different sorts. Some are personal development. Some are more business-focused. We have true crime shows. We have advocacy podcasts, LGBT and things like that. So there's, there's a wide spectrum of different kinds of podcasts. But the punchline simply is, if you start a podcast, is because... You want to put out good information or you have a story to tell. And how do you do that? What are the ways that your show can be better? What are the ways that you can also make it more efficient? Because most of these podcasters don't live off of podcasting. It's a hobby for them. So how can you make it more efficient to where it doesn't feel like a full-time job? You can still have your life and enjoy actually enjoy the process of being a podcaster in whatever topic you choose instead of it being daunting, because what we found is for a lot of folks, it can be quite daunting. Once, once you get into the weeds and you understand everything that you have to do to make it successful, uh, it can be quite daunting. So that's kind of the focus of the coalition. And I love it. I look forward to those meetings every month. I, I bet it must be nice to have that energy in the room and then to bring in 
you know, outside experts who can give the, Hey, have you thought about this? Or, you know, I might have been doing podcasts, but I'm in the media and this can, this can really benefit. So that must be really helpful. Uh, we are coming close to time. So just a couple of quick follow-ups uh, before we get out of here, I want to hit at the very end of your bio, there were, were your interests. And we've talked about podcasting, the other two reading and sports. Uh, what are you reading right now? And how do you determine what to read next? Yeah. So right now I'm reading a great book called million dollar micro business because uh, I started a uh, an education company at the at the end of 2021. It's called Millennial Agent. Uh, so we started the Millennial Agent podcast. We're coming out with courses and things like that. So uh, whenever you start something new, at least me, I try to consume as much info as I can. So going into the e-course space and trying to you know make sure that that we do it effectively. So that is a great book. If there's anybody out there that is even thinking about online courses or or coaching or whatever. Uh, million dollar uh, micro business is a tremendous one. When we talk about sports, my brother is a boxing coach. So I played high school sports. I played football, basketball, soccer. Uh, and my brother is now he's uh, an amateur boxer and a boxing coach. So boxing is also tremendous. If you're stressed out, my friend, go boxing, go to the boxing class. Woo! I'm telling you, it is insane. It's so much fun. Um, so I've, I've enjoyed uh, the boxing journey, if you will. So on that, the boxing journey, do you, are you sparring regularly? Is it more of a cardio workout? What, what is it for you? Uh, because I yeah, found that's the best workout you can have in a lot of different, a lot of different ways for your body. It's wild. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a demanding sport. So yeah, there are classes. So you'll go in, you'll take your, your one hour boxing class and then two days a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, Thursday nights we go in, yeah, and we do sparring. I am the sparring coach, so I'll jump in there sometimes. But it's so fun to see people that don't know anything about the sport. And and when you're exhausted and going one more round, that feeling, if you translate that to your everyday life, it allows you, at least for me, it allows you to tolerate a lot more stress. Because you're so used to the physical pain and you push through it when you're going through mental or emotional pain, if you can bring yourself back to that, it's incredibly healthy and it's been life changing. Awesome. That's, that's a fantastic point. A good way to kind of use that, use that experience in the ring to, to help you outside as well. Um, so we have talked about a ton of stuff today. I'm going to include links uh, to the book, to Millennial Agents, everything else we talked about. Where can our listeners find you or connect with you if they want to uh, learn more or, or to speak with you directly? We're all over the place. Uh, my most active social media platform is Instagram. But if you look for me on Facebook, on TikTok, Twitter, we're all over the place. Um, YouTube channel as well. But as far as uh, if anybody has any any questions or want to shoot me a DM, check me out on Instagram. That's That's where I spend most of my time. <laughs> very nice so we'll post that as well uh we ha again we covered a, a good amount of ground but is there anything i didn't ask you today that i should have tony no i don't think so i think you did a tremendous job yeah well we'll take tremendous job thank you uh, i look forward to doing this again and uh thank you for joining us yeah.